on to good morning ladies and gentlemen we're having a slight bit of technical challenges at the moment and we will begin our program shortly all right we do crave your patience and we will begin shortly continue the conversation i see you're having fun over there <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please stand as we listen to the national anthem being played at this time. UCC President, Ms. Nadine Matthews Blair, VP, Group Marketing, Analytics and Digital, National Commercial Bank Limited, and CEO of the NCB Foundation. Dr. Yvonne Dawkins, Associate Vice President, Academic and Student Affairs here at UCC. Nicole Brown, Senior AVP, in charge of Enterprise Information Management at the National Commercial Bank Jamaica Limited. Mr. Trevor Chung, Assistant Vice President, Digital and User Experience 
National Commercial Bank, Jamaica Limited. The University of the Commonwealth Caribbean and the National Commercial Bank are pleased to welcome you all to today's third annual UCC NCB Memorial Lecture in honor of the late Dr. Rickert Allen, a former senior executive at both institutions. Today's virtual lecture series is being housed under the theme, Navigating AI and Education, Exploring Issues of Impact, Ethics, Access, and Security. Today's lecture series will pay homage to Dr. Allen, who served as chairman of the board of the UCC and senior general manager in charge of, the human, re of human resources at NCB before his untimely death in April 2020. It is fitting this morning that we host this annual lecture series to memorialize the contributions and achievements of Dr. Allen. He was an outstanding and visionary leader who personified effective governance helping the UCC to move towards national and international accreditation status, thus adding value to the academic achievements of the UCC graduates. Dr. Allen was also the consummate HR professional who, was who has used his expertise and foresight to introduce many cutting edge HR practices now used by the NCB group to the benefit of both the employees and the business today. In fact, much of the digitization of the HR processes at NCB can be successfully attributed to his leadership. Dr. Allen believed that the quality of a nation's manpower resources is a critical factor in determining national development and competitiveness and dedicated his life to paying it forward through community service and mentorship. He was indeed a man of integrity, ambition, courage, and honesty. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the management of both institutions, along with the planning committee of this third annual Rickert Allen Memorial Lecture, I wish for you a warm welcome as you participate in today's proceedings of this enlightening and cutting edge discussion topic of AI and education. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'm going to be inviting Miss Maxine Watts to come and offer prayers as we begin the proceedings. Good morning, everyone. May we just bow our heads for prayer. In Matthew 5, uh, the word of the Lord says, And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, when he was seated, when he was settled, and this is something that our Lord always does, he settled himself. And when he was set, when he was settled, he opened his mouth and he taught, and he blessed each and every one of the disciples and the people that were around. And he blessed them and he told them, blessed are the poor, blessed are the peacemaker, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, because they shall be filled. And this morning as we, your children, come before you, we want to thank you, O oh God, that you have blessed us so immensely with all spiritual blessings. And so we give thanks unto you this morning that we are able to be here. And Lord, after you have blessed, Father God, you told us who we are. You said, Lord God, that we are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its savor, where else will it be salted? You are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. And so, Lord, as you told us who we are, that, Lord God, we are the light. 
And that, God, we are to shine. Let our light so shine before men that they will see and be led. And, Lord God, we want to thank you that, Lord God, we have this opportunity, Lord God, to let our light shine. Even as uh, Alan Rickard made his light shine, we are here today to memorialize him and to honor his legacy. And this morning, we want to thank you, O oh God, that these two institutions, NCB and the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean, that had seen it fit, mighty God, to host the third annual, this, this third annual event. And so, Lord, we just ask for your divine blessing. We ask for your divine intervention. And so, God, we ask for special blessings for the panelists. Mighty God, we ask a special blessing for Trevor Forrest. Mighty God, Godiva Golding, Rachel McDonald, and Matthew Stone. We ask God for your blessing upon the moderator. We ask for your blessing upon everyone that shall have anything to do with this event. We ask God that your divine intervention will be felt. And that God, at the end of this this event, Lord God, we would have sensed that you were with us. We give you honor, we give you glory, and we say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so very much, Miss, Mrs. Watts, for that wonderful and spiritual and well-felt prayer. Thank you so very much for that. At this time, we're going to be inviting our, the president of UCC, Dr. Professor Haldane Davies, to come and bring greetings to this wonderful occasion as we celebrate and navigate this topic, AI and education, exploring issues of impact ethics, access, and security. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together as you welcome Professor Haldane Davies. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I acknowledge the protocol already established. Uh, good morning to everyone. It is certainly a joy and privilege uh, for us to be here on this very special occasion today. Uh, we realize that we live in a time and at a moment where knowledge uh, increases uh, every day at a rather rapid rate. Uh, we also live at a time uh, when the opportunities that exist among us uh, to ensure that we are able to be the best that we could be, that those opportunities change at a moment's notice. You know, I was reading an article uh, just uh, the other day, and uh, there was someone referring to the fact that chat GPT is history. Uh, there are newer and more recent inventions on the market uh, than the one uh, that we are so concerned about, even from an educational uh, standpoint. But in all that we do, uh, we realize that it's important for us to acknowledge uh, that in environments such as education and banking, and other areas that we need to ensure uh, that we do our best at all times. And that's why we are here today at this third annual Rickard Allen uh, Memorial Lecture. And the topic for conversation is quite fitting. Uh, it goes to the core as to exactly where we are at this moment in time. Uh, you know, when I leave Kingston by plane and arrive in Miami, uh, get to the immigration, custom, border protection. All I do is just walk up to a machine and it 
even snaps my picture even before I get to it, and it says, proceed, okay? And then uh, the custom officer will then call my name and says, welcome home. And uh, when we look at these situations, I said to my son, Dane, they have me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because where, wherever I go now, I am recognizable anywhere around the globe because what? They have me. Now, as we continue to have these types of conversations, I'm truly honored on behalf of our founders, the board of directors, faculty, staff, students, alumni of this great university to have the privilege of welcoming each one of you to this lecture here today. Uh, you are very important to us. And as we look at the circumstances that exist around us today, and even as we move forward, uh, we value the relationship that exists between UCC and uh, NCB. And that's why today I recognize in particular Miss Nadine Matthews Blair. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. And Nicole Brown also a senior VP uh, for being here. We certainly appreciate your presence. And as I said to Ms. Blair a little earlier on, uh, we will be talking some more soon uh, because there is so much more uh, that NCB and UCC will be doing as we move into the future. So today again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here and for those on the various platforms we are glad that you have tuned in to this very important uh, lecture today. I want to thank also our participants in particular who will share of their knowledge, their expertise, and their skills in this area. And I'll be sitting there with rapt attention uh, to see all that I could learn and understand uh, so that we'll be able to proceed accordingly. So thank you once again, and have a great day meaningful and enjoyable sitting. Thank you. Let's give him another round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Adequately setting the tone for what will be discussed today. And we're looking forward to all of the discussion points from our well and able participants who have joined us this morning. Now, coming to bring greetings and remarks on behalf of the NCB group of companies, I'll be inviting Ms. Nadine Matthews Blair. She is the VP in charge of group marketing, analytics, and digital for NCB. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a rounding round of applause for Ms. Matthews Blair. Good morning and thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if we uh, apologize on behalf of Honorable Minister Favor Williams. She really wanted to be here. She saw the flyer. Trevor, I think you sent it to her and she's like, I have to um, be here. But regrettably, she had an emergency and, and wasn't able to join this morning. Um, Professor Haldine Davis. Dr. Yvonne Dawkins, who we have <laughs> spoken so many times virtually. It's really exciting to be here physically. Um, Kevin Powell, Maxine Watts, uh, my colleague, Nicole Brown, all the speakers, uh, Matthew Stone, Rachel McDonald, Trevor Forrest, my good friend who doesn't take me to lunch. Um, Godiva, I'm not sure if I, I see her yet. Yes, Trevor, it's on the internet. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am, um, and, and let me join everyone in extending my welcome to the third annual Recurt Allen Memorial Lecture. It's my honor to bring welcome and greetings this morning on behalf of Team NCB, UCC and NCB collaborate on this endeavor because of what Dr. Allen meant to both our institutions and we welcome this continued collaboration. And uh, it's, it's really an honor to 
have this lecture. The theme is transformative, and that is a reflection of who Dr. Kurt Allen was as a person, and so it is fitting. So I wanted to ground this discussion in some reflections on Dr. Allen, who I um, call Rick, so I'll refer to him as Rick in my remarks, if you'll allow me. Rick began his career as an engineer at Alcan. So head of human resources and facilities later in his um, career, but he started as an engineer at Alcan. And there, because that was a global company, he would have been exposed to a lot of world-class um, initiatives at the time. And he used to tell our team a story of being told that there was gonna be a truck operated remotely, no driver. And naturally the skeptics, so I don't want to um, date my colleague, but this is talking about in the 80s and the 90s, right? So now driverless cars and trucks don't seem so crazy, but this would have been decades ago. And um, there were many skeptics at the time and uh, they eventually realized that this was possible because they saw it in the, in the flesh. Um, and, and that was an instructive experience for him because he adopted this mindset of it's possible. And that would have been characteristic of his entire service and journey at NCB. So. Um, as our uh, host would have shared, long before the concept of digital transformation and those buzzwords were going around, Rick started to transform NCB in his capacity as head of human resources. And he created a technology work group in HR. A technology work group in HR, separate from our IT division. He wanted to improve and automate processes. I see Nicole smiling. And so he started using open source software, which was completely crazy at the time, but he wanted to boost efficiency, better serve employees, and, and our IT department was primarily focused on enterprise solutions and customer facing solutions. So coming out of that, a system was created to facilitate same day loans for employees, which um, was a big change from employees coming all the way from out of town to head office to apply for loans using paper. And uh, long before NCB offered same day loan to customers, we were able to offer those to employees. So under Rick's guidance, we launched a number of other things, an e-campus platform, the first in Jamaica, virtual learning for all employees, an e-library with global resources, automation of payroll and performance management, and open source software was not widely accepted back then. In fact, there were lots of debates, Trevor is smiling, with IT. But Rick, the visionary, pushed ahead with a focus on solving persistent challenges. And so what open software was then is very comparable to what generative AI is today. They share common traits, such as the collaborative and community-driven development process. It's accessible and affordable, relatively speaking. It's customizable, it facilitates rapid innovation, it's interoperable, and there's a continuous learning uh, cycle that's embedded. These attributes foster and encourage creativity, innovation, and the advancement of technology. Rick pioneered the utilization of open source software in our organization because this was much more accessible than what the big techs were offering at the time. And so the solutions that he introduced in 2007 and eight laid the way for us to smoothly navigate the pandemic at NCB because we were ready for remote work that we were able to turn on um, quite easily, thanks to the foundation that he had laid. Today, Rick's team carries on his legacy 
and now they're leveraging AI powered applications to further enhance our productivity and efficiency. And we also have Nicole Brown, our senior AVP of Enterprise Analytics, who's leading the application of AI for doing the same for our customers. So I start with this reflection on Rick to highlight three lessons that I think will be key to our journey of navigating AI and education. One, the importance of early adoption. There is a lot of discussion a lot of discussion, a lot of waiting and seeing. And I believe history has demonstrated, and I'll talk um, some more about this later, that it's important to adopt even as we contemplate the issues that are out there. Two, address the risks with open platforms, but continue to push forward by leveraging them to solve persistent challenges. Leverage the accessibility that it affords to close large gaps, economic gaps, cost gaps, um, knowledge gaps. And then three, the benefits of compounding. So you can only benefit from compounding. We talk about compound interest, and I think those examples are clear. The earlier you start, the better. It actually works the same way with knowledge. The earlier you start, get your feet wet, make the mistakes, then you build on that and you actually see that you'll be quite ahead of, of, of your fellow companies, your counterparts, your, your countries. So Dr. Allen's actions and leadership, I believe, were embodied by this JFK quote. The problems of the world cannot be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by the obvious realities. We need men and women, my insert there, who can dream of things that never were. So my charge to us today is to successfully navigate AI and education is to embrace and to start the adoption journey early. The compound knowledge from being early in the race will pay dividends over and over again. A couple more reflections on the importance of starting early and the opportunity to close knowledge gaps. I'm going to ask the moderator to just bear with me, the timekeeper, I should say. So in a recent interview, Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft, shared the following. When I was 13, they put a computer terminal in and the teachers found it confusing. We, the students, did not find it confusing. We took over. And then I did the, the school scheduling, decided who would be in what class. I put lots of great women in my own classes that I never got the courage to talk to, but I was planning on it. I had an almost idyllic high school experience, including the early, early exposure to computers. And we all know who Bill Gates is, co-founder of Microsoft um, and the Gates Foundation, and the rest is history. And I compare that to my own experience as a young girl in the Bronx, taking the, the train an hour each way to get to the library because the Bronx Library did not have the resources, or my parents who couldn't afford an encyclopedia until later, or getting a computer at 21. I'm like, boy, if I did, imagine if I didn't get an early start. I mean, I'm happy, right? But imagine the, the early start, right? Um, economic, economist and Dartmouth professor Diego Coleman talks about this similarly. He studied countries, countries that are more advanced, um, their behavior can be correlated to early adoption of technology, early adoption of modern innovations, whether it be in manufacturing or the classroom. Um, Bloomberg recently reported a study where they looked at call center agents who adopted AI, and they found that they were able to close the knowledge gap for the novices, and they started to produce at the same level as the expert, a 14% improvement. And finally, I'll share some remarks from Harvard professor who says, where competitive advantage has historically been found in rote memory and having the ability to 
connect disparate dots of complex calculations, these jobs are going to change. If we think about NASA, the scientists used to spend a, a lot of time doing the math in their head, and so then they got calculators. And so they were able to spend more time focusing on structuring the problems, which is, how do we get to space? And so that's a big part of the opportunity. The acceleration of knowledge access allows us to spend less time on memorizing and learning and turn our attention to solving problems. And the problems are real. In the education space, we know that there are inadequate resources, teacher shortages, overcrowded classrooms, and poor infrastructure, all of which we have an opportunity to solve with AI. And there is enormous potential, not without challenges, and I'm excited that our panelists will cover that in depth today in terms of ethics, security, and so forth. As we delve into the vast and largely untapped potential of AI, I would say let us do so proactively, early, and with open-mindedness to the opportunities it presents. Let us do so collaboratively because there's no one stakeholder can solve this. So government, academia, private sector, and civil society. Um, I know Trevor's always anticipating for when the government gives public, the public those opportunities to weigh in on the laws, right, Trevor? And it's like, why don't they weigh in? It's important. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to say on behalf of my NCB colleagues, that I'm grateful to everyone attending today's lecture physically and virtually as we celebrate Rick's legacy, Dr. Allen's legacy, and explore the transformative potential of AI to transform not just our education system, but our nation more broadly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause. A very, very, very well thorough presentation by Nadine, who just set the tone for the memorial lecture series today as we go into this discuss discussion topic. I'm going to be inviting at this time as we delve into the issues, we delve into the, the topic some more, our moderator for this section, Mr. Nicole Brown, who is a senior assistant vice president responsible for crafting and driving execution of the information management strategy of the NCB group of companies. Her primary focus is on ensuring quality data is preserved as a business asset and that the appropriate level of analytics is employed to effectively deliver financial and strategic returns from the company's crucial data assets. With over 30 years experience in the industry, she currently plays a key role in identifying and working with financial analytics technology providers from startups to well-established players. Coming to lead this discussion on the various aspects of the topic of navigating AI and education, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Ms. Nicole Brown to the podium. We're going to be inviting as well our panelists um, to join us on stage as we get ready to, to delve into this awesome topic. So we're going to invite our panelists. Please, a round of applause too for all the members of this wonderful team of experts who will guide the discussions this morning.
Morning, morning everybody and thank you so much Chair. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, Chair. It really is my pleasure to be a part of the team this morning as we consider artificial intelligence, AI, and education. You know, AI is often considered a threat to people and their jobs because there is the perception that the robots, so to speak, will take over during this digital age. Sorry about that. Um, but the truth is that humans will always be in the loop. That's the reality. And therefore, as we consider AI in education, we have to consider the fact that the challenge that really is part of what organizations face as they drive their efforts at digital transformation is actually accessing the right talent. The people who have the necessary innovation and creativeness to drive the digital change. So the question therefore is how can we employ AI to actually develop talent, develop people, and build the talent pool through our ed educational systems. So that's what we'll consider today in our esteemed panel. We have four thought leaders who will take us through that question as they each deliberate and share their thoughts on one of the issues that we must consider. So as you listen to their thoughts, Make sure to take notes, because you will have the opportunity at the end to participate as we get into our question and answer session where we'll field your questions to the panel. So with that, let's get going with our first panelist. So starting us off today, we'll be will be Rachel McDonald. Rachel is a firm believer in using education as a transformative tool. She created an innovative bilingual early childhood primary program that was offered to multiple locations island-wide. Under the brand Fundaciones. Fundaciones. She thinks that our educational efforts should prioritize social economic development support sessions and community su sustainable projects and is an advocate for advocate for edu ideation and education for sustainable development. Rachel will take us through her thoughts on the impact of AI in the field of education. Thank you, moderator. <laughs> All right, I'm used to standing, so forgive me. It's a teacher thing, so bear with me. Members of Team UCC, Team NCB Group, Foundation, colleagues and friends everywhere, good morning. I am very happy and humbled and grateful to be a part of today's conversation on the impact of education. And I want to just give a special thank you and big ups to the team specifically involved in this, the Rickard Allen um, lecture series. I believe it is quite timely. And I'm really ready to add my three cents to this rapidly developing, or rather on this rapidly, rapidly developing technology known as artificial intelligence and its very profound impact on the educational landscape. 
So my three cents on AI's impact on education will constitute what I like to consider the realities, the hopes, and the punctuation marks. And by punctuation marks, I'm referring to anything that may make us pause or cause us to pause, to question, or to even exclaim as we navigate these issues. So, hold on now. Hmm. Trying to click it, here we are. Bear with me, it's been a while. So what are the realities? The realities are that we kind of know the potential that AI has because some of us are already using it. And what are we using it to do? We are currently using it to personalize learning. Now, personalized learning in this context literally means that AI can help students to learn at their own pace and in a way that is really tailored to meet their individual needs and interests. So you may not realize it, but platforms like Coursera uses AI to recommend courses based on the user's previous learning histories, and I see some head shaking, previous learning histories and interests. And what this can facilitate and allow for are things like continuous quality instruction in and amongst educational practitioners, and also professional and personal development in and amongst all stakeholders in education, and it can do so in very real time. Similarly, you know I'm a Spanish teacher initially and first. So similarly, <laughs> Duolingo, 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 another platform that you may have heard of or even perhaps used with its 120 million users worldwide is a language learning app that uses AI to really personalize and customize lessons. We're also using things like AI, well, we're also using AI to manipulate things like chatbots for frequently asked questions on a 24-7 basis. We're using ChatGPT Prof. And we're also using, more recently, Google's Bard. Now, some chatbots, specifically ChatGPT and Bard, are examples of what we call large language models. And as such, these are types of artificial intelligence that can do things like translate, summarize, answer questions, generate text, and even do fancy things like what I will probably talk about, like coding. Now, I think it's pretty cool, and I use ChatGPT all the time, and since the weekend, I've been using Bard. And what I really want you to understand is that these are not simply opportunities for persons like me who may be a little bit more privileged and knowledgeable about AI, but these are literally applications that many students and parents and teachers are using and beginning to rely on. And these students, parents and teachers are here in places like Jamaica. I know some of my students oh, make up the 350 million users worldwide who are using Brainly to connect with other students and experts to get help with things like homework. And I've seen a few local teachers use Quizlet, um, which is another very popular mobile web-based and um, mobile and web-based application to help learners memorize information using things like flashcards and games. But there's Google Bard, right? Or Google's Bard. And Bard is a new kid on the block. And it is said to possess microchips that are 100,000 times faster than the human brain, right? And in a feature that I watched on the weekend, Bard was able to summarize the New Testament in four seconds, in 17 words, and then in another four seconds, huh? One minute remaining, hey, hey. Lord, I'm just getting started. Anyway, let's try a thing. And then it was able to translate it to Latin in another like four minutes, four seconds. So I want us to really understand how these can really apply to our day-to-day -day learning tasks and what those implications can mean. Now we're also using things like AI to enhance learning through things like gamification and virtual reality. Gamification provides a very immersive and hands-on learning experience by engaging and motivating centered on things like rewards and incentives and competition, immediate feedback, personalization, and even a narrative. So just think game-like elements in non-game-like context. So some examples are things like Kahoot and Minecraft and combat, code combat. Now many of our children play Minecraft, right Uncle Trevor? 
But did you know that Minecraft is like the most or the best selling video game of all time? And it's obviously this way because it is absolutely not your average video game. So with Minecraft, players have the freedom to choose how they play the game, right? You can either choose to play the game in survival mode or in creative mode. Now survival mode, as the name suggests, asks you to survive. So you have to use the resources to build shelter and tools and weapons and to really f fend yourself and fight off the, the hostile mobs that may exist. And of course, in um, creative mode, you can kind of tap into the unlimited resources that exist and fly around space very freely. So as such, games and applications like Minecraft that our children are playing and they talk about in school all the time, really help to promote creativity, critical thinking, um, and collaborative skills. And as such, they can be linked to major subject core content related areas in language, in math, in science, and in history. Then there's virtual reality. Now, VR creates an environment, or a rather virtual en environment, in which you can interact in a realistic way. And this is used widely for things like field trips, for things like science experiments, to teach Spanish, and even for things like historical reenactments. And it was shared that VR use, specifically as it relates to field trips, increased by about 550% at the start of the pandemic alone. That was between January and June 2020. So we, we have a general understanding of how this impact looks and, and, and what it feels like and where we're heading. Now, naturally because students are beginning to engage differently and in very personalized ways and because they're relying on these large language models and gamification and VR, there is a lot more enjoyment in the process of learning. And because of that, this is going to lead to ultimately stronger outcomes and better learning outcomes, right? Now our second reality, and it's probably mixed up on the slide, our second reality is perhaps pretty obvious for us, especially in a place like Jamaica, and it is that there exists issues pertaining to equity. Now there is undoubtedly the potential for AI to transform the landscape, yet because of very limited resources and infrastructure, not all learners, especially ours, are being able to tap into this use of AI in the learning process. So I'm specifically referring to things like a lack of internet still that some students and some spaces do not have, as well as devices in which to engage with AI. And thirdly, I want to point out that AI's rate of development is rapid. One time, long time ago, we used to have to wait for a year, for example, between the latest iPhone releases. Now technology is changing in a matter of days and weeks, right? So with that said, ultimately we see where there's an inclination towards an increase in the use of AI. And I'm just gonna beg you for a little bit more time. I got in trouble all the time for talking. Moderator, can you permit me, please? Just two more minutes? Hey, hey. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the hopes are. My hopes are that we can really begin to continue to use AI and to maximize on its potential. And we can do this by beginning to guide learners in working alongside AI and for bracing for the inevitable changes. And we can do this by literally beginning to sensitize education stakeholders to what AI represents and how we can use it, right? Um, I also really want us to start using, I, I work with teachers too, and I want us to start using AI more to really offer real-time support for teachers. Now, since AI is powerful enough to fill the gaps in education by being able to process data, i.e. test scores and grades, as you know, um, it can also create customized lesson plans and forms of assessments, and it can even automate administrative tasks like grading. This is going to lead to increased efficiency in our teachers, and it can also free them up a little bit and send them home earlier. Now, in Jamaica and in several other countries across the world in the last couple of months, we have seen major learning disruptions as a result of teacher strikes. And teachers strike because they feel as if they're not compensated well enough for the work that they have to do. Now, if their workload can become easier and they can go home earlier, then our teachers can go home and use said AI to generate additional wealth. So that is something for us to consider. And lastly, I want us to talk a little bit about moving it from talk shop to action. So we want to ensure that, you know, we, ta we start to look at things like examining the idea of larger scale inclusion, policy, and also regulation. But remember, I spoke about the punctuation marks, and this is the last slide. 
I call the punctuation marks a couple of the things that may make us go, hmm, right? And these are, number one, a reliance on technology. Now, many people feel that we have become too reliant on technology, but can you imagine life without some of the technological tools that we have? Last night, when I was going to bed, I was scrolling through TikTok. Yeah, I'm one of those. And I saw this little clip on AI being used in a Chinese classroom. And AI now has the potential to inform parents every time a child yawns and every time a child becomes distracted in class. AI also has a chip that the students have in their uniform so that parents know where the child is at all time. And the essence of the feature was really just talking about what a, how bothersome that is and kind of annoying for, for, for children. I mean, that is something that, we, you know, we can say, hmm, like, hmm, okay. Now, another question mark or a punctuation mark would be the questionability of bias. And we know that if the data that AI is trained on is biased, then the AI system is going to be biased. And this must be considered because bias will lead to unfair student outcomes. The next punctuation mark is that we really begin to examine issues of data privacy and security, and we have no one better here than Trevor Forrest to talk and lead us through um, that. But recently in the news in the US, in the state of Arizona, you may have seen how AI was used to alter um, a teen's voice, and it was a major kidnapping, one million US dollar scam. So whilst this is clearly not the direction that we would want for AI, this is one of the implications that can affect our educational landscape. Next, we move on to the matter of job displacement and job replacement. Now, the founder of ChatGPT has shared that with every technological revolution comes the, you know, the removal of certain jobs. So let's think about what a holistic education represents, and you know that it represents a little bit more than just merely literacy and math. And let's think about what else constitutes a wholesome and fulsome learner, a well-rounded student. And that would be the addition of things like soft skills. Now, a lot of these soft skills, AI is boasting that it can contribute to. So AI is now boasting that it can work and encourage empathy and even social emotional learning. Now, should we be worried? I think perhaps we could be. Right, And lastly, would be that we begin to really think on the things, well, urgency really, surrounding matters of policy and regulation. And as we consider taking information that is not ours, using AI, um, cheating and plagiarism are a big part of, of this um, sphere. And because we're going to be using something very extensively, which I foresee, I think some sort of guiding policy is going to be key. So as I conclude, I reminisce on the pandemic and the fact that it really threw all of us, especially those of us in the education sphere, into this sort of haste or this need to really transform education and to meet sustainable development goal number four, which is a quality education. And this may not have been a bad thing. So transforming education, however, does not take place that quickly or at least not as yet. And so I really believe that AI has the potential to transform education and to really revolutionize it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for taking us through some of what AI is already doing in education and the implications. And audience, you will have the opportunity to field your questions, reminding you to send them through in the chat, and we'll be able to field any questions around that presentation later. But I'm sure a number of you would remember that first drone light show that we had in Jamaica on our 60th. And in fact, our next speaker was the brainchild of that work. And luckily, his passion is not limited to drones. He's also passionate about AI, to the extent that he has actually founded the Jamaica Artificial Intelligence Association. He also is pursuing his doctorate in the field of artificial intelligence. And so Matthew Stone is well placed to tell us about the second part of our lecture, AI and ethics in the field of education. Matthew? All right, thanks for having me. All right, so AI and ethics. So that's what I'll be talking, that's what I'll be talking about today. 
Now, ethics is one of those things in AI that, especially for people in tech, that we don't really like to think about. Because, especially when people in tech hear the word ethics, we think regulation, we think, all right, let's stop the, the technology. Especially because the ethos in Silicon Valley, a famous tech hub, it's move fast and break things. So anytime people hear the word ethics, it's kind of stopping that. But I think especially now, with AI being a very transformative technology and it has the ability to literally transform every industry. I mean, life on a whole will change in the next coming years. So I think ethics, it's actually a very important time that we actually pay um, a lot of attention to ethics. So ethics generally describes the moral implications of how we use and develop AI technology. So I'll be going through some of the moral implications of AI technology, some of the things we can probably do to kind of counter the negative effects or the possible negative effects of AI technology. Now, when a lot of you heard this topic of AI and ethics, you probably thought I was going to speak about killer robots. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about killer robots today. If you want to learn about killer robots and AI, there are a lot of movies out there that you can watch that talk about AI and killer robots. I think in the near term, there are some things that are immediately going to affect us as a society that have some deep moral implications. So there are some ethical concerns in AI. So one of which is bias and, mis and misinformation. So we've probably heard this term misinformation before, um, especially with the advent of this new technology, large language models. Now more than ever, it's very possible for people to generate fake information. And we've seen what effects fake information can have on societies. We have privacy and data protection. I don't think people understand the power of data data is very powerful. A lot of these free applications that you guys are using, such as the TikTok, the social media sites, yes, you're using them for free, but they're making a lot of money off of you. And that data that they're collecting on you is very powerful. With new AI technology, we could see a future where this data is actually used to possibly control societies. There's also transparency and explainability. Especially with the advent of ChatGPT, a lot of students have been using ChatGPT for their assignments, maybe to write papers. Now, I must stress this. ChatGPT, although it is very impressive technology and it does output factual information a lot of the times, some of the times it does hallucinate, meaning it will give you information that sounds plausible, but is It all depends on the speed at which we adopt it as a society. Now, if we let the first world countries adopt it very quickly, and we in the third world, we kind of just wait and see what happens, because of the speed at which this technology advances, we could possibly see a widening of the gap between the first and the third world countries. So it's important that we start to think about how we can quickly start to adopt this technology so we can close the gap instead of it widening. So let's talk about bias and misinformation. Now, the fact is AI tools are susceptible to bias. So what do I mean by bias? Bias can come in many forms. Bias can come in the form of racial bias, location bias, cultural bias. The fact is the people that are working on these technologies, it's not that they are the ones that are biased or they're racist or anything like that, but the fact is these technologies are trained with data, and the bias is found within that data. Remember, we as humans, we inherently have some biases. And if you go on the internet, you guys have probably used the internet before, and you've seen the amount of you know, disgusting things that have been said on the internet. Now, it's important, especially for students going into the field of AI, that we pay keen attention to the data sets that we use 
because if we don't control the data that we're using to create these AI technologies, all these inherent biases that we as humans have produced throughout the years can now be reflected in the AI technology. Now there have been several examples where even Google Images had mistaken um, black people as say um, gorillas, for example. So as I mentioned before, you have several types of biases. Now, misinformation. Because of generative AI, the ability to produce misinformation has literally exploded. And we've seen what misinformation can do to societies. We've seen that through the, throughout the pandemic. Now more than ever, bad actors have the ability to use misinformation to control societies in a way that we could not have imagined. One example is, for example, if uh, someone wanted to change an election, for example, or the outcome of an election, it's very easy for someone to use even current AI technology today to generate a lot of news, um, fake news stories and fake news briefs that discredit the opposition. Let's talk about privacy and data protection. Now, a lot of people have heard the word data, but they don't really understand data. Now, let me say this once. Data is probably one of the most powerful things on this planet. The data that these technology companies are collecting from you, it's very powerful. In fact, as time goes on, they'll be collecting more and more data from you. Not just the data that you put into a social media site or the amount of time you spend on a social media site, but also health data. You're gonna start seeing more biomedical devices that are collecting actual real-time information from you. Now with this data, they can actually know a lot about you and know how you think. They can know more of how to control you. So as a society, we need to think about the implications of this. We need to also think about who owns your data. Again, you guys are using all of these social media sites like the TikTok and children are using these sites and they don't even realize that the data that they're collecting on the, our children today, they have so much power. Now what does privacy look like for the future? We need to also think about this because as these technology companies get more and more powerful, you know, what sort of information will they have access to? As a society, we need to think about policies and regulations as to what's data they'll be limited to and what data they'll be have access to. And I want to reiterate this last point, data is very powerful, right? Every time you use a social media site, whenever you go on it, it's literally learning what things you like, what things you don't like, who you'd likely vote for, um, what foods you like. All of this information has power. Information is power. <laughs> Let's talk about transparency and explainability. As I said before, AI can hallucinate. Now a lot of students are gonna be using these technologies and I, I'm an advocate for using AI in the classroom. I think it's very important, especially now as a society, especially Jamaican society, we've been used to sort of waiting on technology, waiting for it to come to us. Now more than ever, we're going to have to take a proactive approach. So we're going to have to go towards the technology. We have a chance, more than ever, to close the gap between third world countries and first world countries. But that really is pertinent on us to actually take a proactive approach. So you guys have probably seen a lot of fake images um, on the internet that look absolutely real. This is an image of the Pope, and that's actually not the Pope wearing a vest. But that's an AI's imagination of how the Pope would look wearing a very um, fashionable outfit. So in the future, we're going to have to think about what is real versus what is fact. It's gonna be a lot harder going forward for us to even know what is real versus what is fake. Especially, I could even think of even using generative AI today, generative AI technology, someone could possibly create a fake news briefing or a fake announcement of, let's say, Prime Minister Andrew Holness um, saying that there's some new lockdowns and that causes a panic in society. And so there, they, even with current 
day technology, it's very possible to um, sow chaos in society. I think going forward, I know a lot of people have been saying that AI is going to make students a lot more lazy, you know, it's going to make them cheat. I don't think cheating is an AI problem, I think cheating is simply a morality problem. If anything, AI simply makes it easier to cheat, but the students who are going to cheat, they were cheating before AI. I think AI will, if anything, for the students that were actually hardworking and productive, it will help them to be more hardworking, help them to be more productive. Even I, as a student, it has helped me um, throughout my studies. But students going forward are going to have to be critical thinkers. Because as I said, going forward, it's going to be easier to produce misinformation. So as a society as a whole, we're going to have to be able to think more critically. Now let's talk about equity and access. Now as I said, AI could potentially widen the wealth gap. Now it could do the opposite. But that is really dependent on us as a society, especially us as a Jamaican society, to really be proactive in our use of the AI technology. We can't wait, and I must stress this, we cannot wait for it to come to us. We have to be proactive and go at the technology. We we'll have to start thinking about policies and ways to integrate it into our society, because if we wait, the speed at which this technology moves, we're going to get left further and further behind. Students are going to be asking this very important question, where are the jobs? I know a lot of people have been saying, you know, with time, technology, new jobs come about, but this is different. AI technology mm -hmm. is so powerful, it could possibly replace a lot of the jobs that we humans are doing right now. I can even think of a local example. I, for example, I think the BPO sector in Jamaica is in trouble. I think in the next one or two years, we could see that sector completely transformed. And we may have to think about how we're going to handle that drastic shift in employment. As I said, it could also widen the education gap. The previous speaker touched on this example where a class in China was using AI technology. China is doing the right thing. They're being proactive and actually seeing how AI technology can be used right now in, society, in their society. We need to do the same thing or we're going, our students are gonna get left behind. AI has the potential of making learning equitable to everyone, meaning every, I believe there's a future where every student has their own personalized tutor or teacher but as I said, we as a society, we have to be proactive and adopt it. Um, I'll end by just saying that you know, I think it's important for us as a society to take AI very seriously. There are a lot of moral implications going forward. We we'll have to think about it and we we'll also have to, right now, start crafting policies of how we're going to handle AI as a society. I think we we'll have to adopt it right away, try to see how we can use it in our everyday lives. It's not going to go away. We'll have to see how AI can improve our society. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, for again emphasizing the bias for action that we need to take in terms of employing AI, as well as emphasizing the cautions that we need to consider and what okay. we need to handle. So having looked at the impact that AI of AI and on the ethics around AI, we now need to examine how can we make it accessible, what's the access of AI in education. So that's what our next speaker will speak to. She's Godiva Golding, described as a change agent, and she's a young woman who is fueled by courage and focused on big dreams. Her list of awards and accolades include being formally recognized as a young innovator at the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. She was the recipient of the PM's Youth Award in 2017 and as a member of the 2021 cohort of the Leaders of Americas were able to sharpen her entrepreneurial skills. So today, she's the founder and CEO of the Steam House Network and is working assiduously 
to nurture a larger pool of digitally savvy Jamaicans. God, I have all over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here because AI is something that we have been talking about for some time. So to have the focus of this lecture being on AI just really sinks into the fact like we are in the zeitgeist and we're doing the right things about it. No, I think I have the most interesting topic, which is access. Um, we get up every day and we talk about AI, you know, AI is taking our jobs, AI is making our children stupid. But when we go a little further, um, addressing root cause helps us to then think more critically about this. Um, PEP is one of those exams that is meant to have our children think critically. I think AI will help us to think critically too. Now, the topic of my little five minutes is supporting educational objectives. Now, I want us to go to first principle. Think about what is the main objective of education. All right? Ponder on it in your minds. And there are two things that jump right out at me. One, career readiness, job readiness. But the slightly more all-encompassing objective is a well-learned holistic citizen able to participate in this world and, and make their contributions in a positive way. Now, how can AI help us to achieve this? Now, I did pull this little trends map from Google Trends because I think it was important to just understand for a quick second you know, the landscape that is being created. I looked at two things, chat GPT and artificial intelligence, right? So chat GPT is the blue lines that you're seeing, artificial intelligence, those red lines. Now, the graph at the bottom basically points to the year 2021 into 2022. And what you realize is that there is more interest in AI on a whole than in something like ChatGPT. And I say this because ChatGPT has been around for a while, but it hasn't been at the forefront of our minds. It hasn't been something that we've actually considered. And just for context, this Google trend map looks solely on Jamaica. Now, I'm going to point out something as a matter of some of the work that Steamhouse has been doing you may be seeing a spike on the 2021-2022 graph. And that highest spike there is where we would have had the first Jamaica AI code fest. And we would have been targeting students as young as 10 years old, right up to tertiary level, 24 years old. And we found some interesting things there that I'm going to be talking about a little bit more. But look at where we were, 2021-2022, to where we are now, 2022 into 2023. The trends have been consistently growing in terms of interest and access. And we are asking questions, what does this really mean for the educational landscape? And what does it mean for educators as we think about students cheating, as we think about students you know, using these tools unlike they have before? So I think it's really important to just ground what is AI? And it's not a complicated definition, everybody has their own, but I think this one was really capture a lot of what we'll be discussing a little later, is that the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, all right? And we want to focus on that word intelligence. We're looking at visual perception, decision-making, speech recognition, translation between language. So, what are the things that are the hallmark of human intelligence? Again, it's saying decision-making, visual perception, speech recognition, and language translation. But I want to say that when we talk about AI in comparison to the rest of the world, how are we really faring? Again, along those metrics, decision-making, speech recognition, and what was that last one there? Visual perception. And 
I think the grounding point for all of this is that AI doesn't come out of thin air. AI comes from the data that is generated in our world. And for the most part, when you look at emerging economies like Jamaica, most countries in the developing world, when you look at Africa, you will hear this word come up a lot, data deserts. We live in data deserts. That means that the fundamental aspect of our AI models or machine learning models is missing. And again, going back to, just going to the, the definition here, geographic areas characterized by a lack of access to, not just data in general, but high quality data. Because we do have data here in Jamaica, but do we have access to high quality data that will help us in decision making, visual perception, and those language models that we're now using. And at the end of the day, this high quality data is supposed to be able to help us to generate social and economic benefits. Now, I think just to illustrate this point, I want you to look at the slide a little bit. So we've been talking about chat GPT, we've been talking about data deserts, we've been talking about accuracy. And I want you to look at question one, um, question eight actually, what is the most common form of transportation in Jamaica? Is it A, cars, B, buses, C, motorcycles, D, walking? The answer there is buses. Now, the second question is where it gets a little interesting, where it asks ChatGPT, what is the popular mode of transportation in rural areas of Jamaica? And A, buses, B, taxis, C, motorcycles, D, donkeys. And now, the response that would have been returned is D, donkeys. I can honestly say the last time I saw a donkey in rural Jamaica, <laughs> like, it's been a while, I know they exist, but is it a popular form of transportation? No, it is not. So that is again why we have to focus on why our data deserts need to be data havens, data rainforests. And it starts with data literacy and digital literacy that delves down not just on, hey, can we use the tool, but how do we generate the data that would be going into these models so that the next time you ask ChatGPT what is the most popular transportation in rural Jamaica, it will not tell us donkeys. So benefits to teachers, uh, there's a gamut. There are so many tools now that not just ChatGPT, Khan Academy is working on beta tools. Um, we have edtech companies in our own landscape building out AI tools, not just for teachers, but for students as well. And a big part of this is to trim down, again, on the number of hours that students, or rather teachers, spend doing things outside of teaching. So going back, how do we use these things for data-driven data decisions, visual perception, and large language learning models that can then generate economic and social value. Now, I really like to do this exercise from time to time. I hope I'm not too pressed on time. But for if you're tuning in online or if you're in the audience now, I want you to close your eyes for a second. I'd like to do a little meditation with us. And I want you, I'm gonna count to three. I wanna see those eyes. One, two, three. Now, I want you to think about your most, uh, like your favorite teacher. Think about your favorite teacher, be it um, primary school, high school, university. And I hope you have a name in your head by now. And you're going to think about next, what did you like most about your teacher? All right? So we've all thought about that. All right, open your eyes. Now, I'm thinking that most of us, like me, my favorite teacher was probably Mr. Gabadon. He taught me math. Um, he was an interesting character, to say the least. But one thing that really stood out is how much he always believed in my ability and always pushed me to do more. 
it was that sort of motivation that a child needed in that kind of environment to feel like they were allowed to excel. And I would imagine that for you, you weren't thinking your favorite teacher was your favorite teacher because they gave you um, a 90% score, or they marked your papers, or they did a great lesson plan. <laughs> you were thinking that your favorite teacher was that they did some of the most human things. They believed in you, they made you feel as if you could believe in yourself. And then from there, yes, they would have gone on to mark the papers, send them to Ministry of Education when you were getting ready for CXC and CAPE. You know, they made sure that the SBAs and the IAs were done on time. Now, the question is, as we look about AI and the benefits of teachers, the question, again, has to be, how do we have the very human things that teachers are doing focus more on being able to be there for their students and less on lesson planning? Because more than 50% of the classroom time or time that teachers spend is not necessarily spent on teaching and learning. It is not spent on ensuring that the educational experience for students is such that they can double down on some things like motivation, the very human aspect. So as we come down to time, the main benefit is that teachers very well may be getting back their time. But AI tools can go way, way further than this. Because we tend to think about AI in education specifically to the teaching and learning process. But there are more aspects that we can explore, and it starts with good quality data. So some of the additional issues that we experience in the education system relate to things like PATH, relate to nutrition programs, relate to truancy. We have seen three years, basically, of learning loss. And now the question, again, how can we use AI tools to address these issues that are outside of the realm of teaching and learning, expanding, again, the data sets that we have and access to quality data? Ministry of Education, a lot of data companies would have been here already collecting data, but is it usable enough? Will it give you enough insight to make decisions to be able to say we are going to generate economic and social value from this? So there are my not two cents, but it's rather a nanny. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to answering a lot of questions. All right. Thank you, Godiva. And thanks for that plug about questions, reminding our audience that your questions are welcome. Please share them in the chat. Thank you, because after our final speaker, who we'll, we'll hear from shortly, we'll be going into our question and answer sessions. So our final speaker will speak on the very critical aspect of cybersecurity. And he basically needs no introduction because of his tag, Mr. Open Source. He was a major evangelizer for the use of open source, both in public and private sector. And he has consulted in the design and evaluation of numerous ICT projects and digital transformation strategies. And he's committed to improved standards of ICT adoption. Today, Trevor is the CEO of 876 Solutions, and he will speak to us again about cybersecurity. Trevor. All right, morning, everybody. Um, so, Nadine, I'm sorting out the lunch thing. We'll be scheduling that next week. So, and no, Rachel, we're not giving away lunches like that. Sorry. Although Rachel is responsible for the growth and development of my very smart son. Um, so today I am very happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged now because I was given five minutes. I'm actually going to take seven. Um, so I'm going to see if I can stay within that time limit. So I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and security. Now why is this important? It's important because as we use and go more digital. We use more and more technology. As we increase uh, how we teach, um, increasing the use of devices and so on, one of the things that that does is that it creates new opportunities. Good, but also it creates bad opportunities. Um, 
And what we see coming out of that is a rise in, in cyber threats. And you hear it all the time on the news. Um, data breaches, information being stolen, um, entities, um, you know, uh, having money fleeced, a lot of fraud happening and so on. And what you find is that um, as we move into, into that space, we, we are now required to seek ways to protect sensitive data. And in doing so, um, it is the responsibility of not only governments and businesses, but to, to, to become compliant with all the different laws associated with it. We're using a lot more data. Um, by 2025, we're talking about you know, 79 zettabytes worth of data. That's a lot. Um, and because these technologies are, are rapidly evolving, um, uh, we're using more complex networks. We're, we're, we're doing a lot more uh, with, with the technologies that we have, the devices that we use, tablets, phones, laptops, and so on. Um, we're now creating a lot more threat services, and the threat services are much larger. And what that does to, to our you know, threat actors is it gives them more motivation to come up with new ways of attacking these surfaces. These surfaces are you and me. These services are the businesses that um, provide services to us. So, so, so in, in light of all of that, what we start to find is that now we need people and technologies to help to defend against these attacks that are coming. Right? So, so what that means is now we're starting to see this shortage and because of a demand a shortage of cybersecurity experts in the marketplace, right? And what I wanted to show here was, was the fact that the, there's about a 2 million uh, user def or, or workforce deficit for cybersecurity experts in the market. So there's a huge demand. In, in the United States alone, it's over 400,000. And the growth of the cybersecurity field is projected to increase uh, by 31 percent between 2019 and 2029. That's a 10-year time time period, and that's exponential. All right. So, 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 and of course, the value of this industry is projected to be about 300 million, sorry, billion dollars. All right. Again, huge industry, lots of opportunities, but the demand is huge educational institutions have to pay attention to that, right? But what you also have to pay attention to is the changes that are occurring in these spaces. The top 15 threats that currently exist, malware, ransomware, um, IoT attacks, uh, denial of service attacks, these are the kinds of attacks that exist out there, attacks on websites, uh, fraud. Um, uh, we, we get, you know, into nation state attacks where we have cyber espionage. Um, you know, those are who are in cryptocurrency, crypto jacking. A uh, lot of these are the, the kinds of attacks that are prevailing now. I mean, we always hear about data breaches, data leakage, and so on. But what we're seeing now is that the kinds of threats, given what's happening with AI, have started to evolve. So by 20. 2030, which is incidentally when we have our, um, the culmination of our vision for what Jamaica should be. In 2030, we're seeing a new type of threat emerge, right? We're looking at threats to supply chains. We're looking at threats to, to um, information, right? And, and many of our, our presenters have talked about, you know, how it, misinformation will start to be, be prevalent. We have seen, uh, and we're going to see, new forms of surveillance. And this surveillance is going to be in the digital realm. We're going to see, um, and again, we're talking about AI. We're going to see where AI's use in perpetrating a lot of these attacks and, and, and threats is going to increase. All right? AI is going to become very important in all of these sorts of new attacks. But there's something else that we want to also pay attention to, and again, this is important to educational institutions. The skills gap continues. 
because we're not keeping up now and it is projected that we won't be keeping up in future with the skills gap that will exist and interestingly enough ai is going to play a part in that skills gap right so what are some of the advantages of, of using AI? Because there are some clear advantages of using AI. AI, because of its ability to, to, to assess and analyze huge data sets, allows for more intelligent um, and more proactive uh, uh, vulnerability assessments, um, threat detection and prevention. So it makes the job of security analysts and, and security practitioners a lot easier. Right? It allows us to... to to be very proactive, it allows us to be more analytical, but it also allows us to automate some of the mundane tasks that we have to do on a daily basis, right? Because once you can detect threats, analyze threats quickly, which is what AI can do for you, then you can respond in a you know, very efficient and proactive way. Um, it helps us, um, especially in financial institutions, with fraud detection. It looks at patterns. Because so some of you may realize that, you know, you travel and you try to use your, your, your credit card. And something says to you, yeah, 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 you can't use a credit card because this is not something you normally buy. And that kind of intelligence is based on the fact that patterns, um, your behavior, what you buy, Normally, so if you normally buy clothes and then one day you're buying a car, eh, this doesn't really fit your pattern. Intelligence is what guides these things. And this is how artificial intelligence is advantageous in reducing fraud, increasing security. But there are some risks. Yeah, there are some risks. The kind of protection that comes from, from using artificial intelligence can also be used by the threat actors, right? They can use artificial intelligence to create malware, to create that software that they use against us, right? And in fact, they have AI that, and you, anybody in here can use it, that way you simply say, look, develop uh, malware that will do so and so and the code is written um, mark you you have to reassess the code and make sure that it's doing exactly what you're doing but the fact is threat actors can now create malware at startling speeds right because now they don't have to sit and invest the kind of time that they used to invest to create this stuff the next thing is the emergence of what we call adversarial AI. Now, um, it was mentioned before about bias. Now, again, AI learns from data. If the data is bad, the output is going to be bad. If the data is wrong, the expected outcome is going to be wrong. So, one of the things that that does is if I want AI to fail, I give it bad data. So, if I'm a threat actor, and I wanted to cause bad information, bad results, bad analysis of um, security information, then I would look to feed it, feed those systems bad information. And that's where you will see an increase in what they call algorithm data breaches. Because the algorithms that AI uses to, to assess, to to create responses, to be efficient, if that data is bad, that data is now the target of a threat actor. Because if I can make that data incorrect, in fact, if I can tell that data to do a particular thing I want it to, then suddenly the AI does that. Right? So, so it's very important to understand these risks. Um, uh, there are a lot of new trends that are coming up. I mentioned some of them before, behavioral analysis. And again, behavioral analysis is what is used in a lot of uh, fraud mitigation uh, technologies. Um, but one that I think is really cool is, is natural language processing, which um, again, some of you are used to with chat GPT, where you simply put in a prompt and a response comes back. But um, in the security space, um, just telling a system what you want to do 
and having it do so again this becomes a, 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 a real boon to to um, new ways of looking to secure systems and, and developing platforms that do so and of course allowing systems now through the information that we feed to it to make certain decisions based on rules um, uh, that, that we provide um, leads to you know the increase in autonomous systems and so on so how how does all this play into the the education uh, system and now these are some of the things I, I just want to touch on that educators educational institutions need to pay attention to um, especially in the realm of, of um, cyber security one um, and it was mentioned before the lack of transparency now what does that mean thing about AI is nobody knows how it comes up with what it comes up with these are cognitive learning systems you they use algorithms to determine certain outcomes but you can't teach students in a classroom how that works because this stuff is happening real time in a kind of dynamic way so um, because it's hard to understand then it's hard to teach what is happening um, another concern that has to be to be looked at is an increasing over reliance on AI so uh, in, in quick and easy terms if I don't have to write an essay on chat GPT can do it for me I'm going to rely on chat GPT that impacts my writing skills because now all I have to do is ask for what I want and somebody does it or something does it and what that does is it makes students and practitioners uh, more reliant on AI but then less competent in the fundamentals of what is required to actually do the work and this is why you know the moderator says look there's always going to be that human element how that human element interacts with the AI is very important but as in the education component we have to ensure that we establish that balance that needs to occur between using the AI and learning the fundamentals of whatever platform you're using AI in. Finally, I want to speak about um, the privacy, data protection, and ethical issues. Because one of the biggest concerns that we have is that, again, AI systems today learn from massive data sets. A lot of these data sets are on the internet. And one of the concerns that we have is we don't know how it uses that information we don't know the content that it is using um, and a lot of that information that it is using is personal sometimes sensitive and we don't know how to control that effectively not a legislation that we have currently speaks to how AI engines interact and use that information so in profiling you know, we use TikTok, we use Instagram, and a lot of these platforms, they gather information from you, then they use it to create a profile uh, about you, and then it uses artificial intelligence to kind of figure out how to engage you, how to interact with you, what buttons to press, given your behavioral patterns to get you to do things, right? And none of this involves human beings. And one of the things that is a very... Um, concerning is all that data that it needs to do that is out there <laughs> it has access to this so how do we ensure that the information that is out there when it is engaged by these AI systems is not improperly used and this is something again that we have to look at especially when we're talking about data protection and privacy laws and um, when you're imparting that kind of knowledge to students in school as to understanding the value of data so in closing um, I just wanted to, to close with this quote all right because it's something again AI is not something we should fear AI is not something that um, we should try not to use right embracing the opportunities and risks associated with AI in education and, and of course cyber security is not about advancing technology only it's about empowering the individuals that you're engaging with to use this stuff to shape a better future through responsible innovation. You know who said that?
So I, I, I hope the information that, that you know, I knocked out in my seven or eight minutes um, was, was impactful to you. And I, I thank your moderator for, for indulging. Absolutely, Trevor. And very impactful presentation indeed. I was happy that you emphasize, again, as other speakers, the need to start adopting AI. And also that it can help solve the skill gap problem. Uh, that's the question we wanted to ponder. How can we employ AI to, to develop people and, and grow the talent pool? Um, but you also aptly focus on the threats and what we need to do to avoid. So thank you very much. Again, audience, I'm encouraging you to keep the questions coming in. We're going to go directly into our question and answer session where, sorry, Yes. That's a very good question, and Kevin, like, perfect. So, you know, for me, I'm anti-homework. I've always believed that children are going to find a way to not give you what you want them out of homework. And we have to also look at what homework is aimed at doing. Homework is really an opportunity for teachers to really find out if you've grasped what you've learned in class. So I've always believed in the concept of a flipped classroom where you, you learn it independently on your own and then you come into the space and then you kind of ask questions and we really get the ball going. Now, what you've mentioned, where we draw the line, I think that's an important question and this is where matters of policy and regulation are going to come in. For me as a Spanish teacher, giving homework and for them checking it out, it's going to be conjugate a verb. Now they can conjugate a verb using AI, they can conjugate a verb using anything. We want them to remember how to conjugate those verbs and to remember those endings. But this is where the conversation needs to begin. Where do we draw the line? What is acceptable? How do we navigate the space? So these are the types of questions that we need to have. We can play out, we can hash out some more because currently there is no level playing field and we just literally don't have the answers to that. Um, and I really and truly believe that we need to continue this conversation just to find out where we're going to stop it. Plagiarism is a big, big issue. Cheating is a big, big issue. And there's no policy right now. Um, there's no legislation where that is concerned. OK, thank you. Oh, there you go. All right, my second question goes out to, I believe, the second speaker that spoke about data. Now, as an IT student, because I am a part of the IT program here at UCC, I hear the word data thrown around a lot. I did a course this semester called Computer Data Analysis, but I am still left pondering how can my own personalized data, how can the data of my family and my friends be used against all of us? So we know that it can be used, but how? Well, I mean, if you ask yourself why you spend so much time on these social media apps like the TikTok, um, they are actually actively using your data against you to make you do that. So they learn your preferences and they know what you like, they know exactly what will make you addicted to the platform. So that's an example of how even social media platforms are using data against you. Um, I mean, there have been documented examples even in previous elections, I won't say which one, um, where 
data was used to possibly you know influence the outcome of that election I think going forward you know because of the power of data it can be used to possibly control societies it can be it, right now people are using data to control what you buy you know how you even think you know a lot of the stuff you look, you see on social media you, know, you may take it as fact but if the truth is what these social media companies are doing they're not necessarily showing you the truth they're just showing you things that they think you would like to see so they keep pushing you the same thing that kind of aligns with your quote unquote worldview and that, what the danger of that is it keeps you in this echo chamber where you sort of just keep getting information that only aligns with your worldview and you stop thinking about how other people may think about that same topic differently. So that's just one example of how data can be used against you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I just want to add something to that. Um, something that you want to always be cognizant of, um, which is a slightly different way of looking at the value of your data. If you use a service that is free, then you're the product, right? And the concept of you being a product uh, misses some people, but understand you being the product means your data, the information about you is valuable, which means if I can get it, then I can sell it. And if I can sell it, then somebody else can use it to do something. So when you go online and you do searches, if I can understand what you search about, then I can say this is what is valuable to you. And as such, I can start tailoring communication to you about what appears to be valuable to you based on your behavior. So that is something that you always want to do, like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of these platforms. N nobody forced you to give them your information. You did it yourself. Because eh, the barrier to providing it was extremely low. But you didn't consider what the value of that information that you you know, dripped to them was until you start seeing things. Oh, yeah, you know, this is interesting to me. Okay. And as you continue to be that product, your data becomes increasingly value. So, so always consider that. Okay. Right, just just one more. Okay. Oh, I think um, I'm going to piggyback on that for a quick second. I just wanted to introduce the concept of, of data unions. So as much as we are talking about, you know, how our data is used, how we've been turning to products, which is very much a part of the reality. Um, the flip side of that is how we can be a part of unions or cooperative that gives us more control of our data and allows us to be paid, more or less, for the data that we share. Your data is valuable, and there are mechanisms being developed that will allow you to leverage that value. Data unions are just one form of that. Okay, my final question, and this goes out to all the panelists, so I'm not, I don't remember specifically who was talking about this, but they said, and I'm just roughly paraphrasing now, is that AI systems use a lot of information that they collect from different data sets. The more information, the more, the more data, e data that they collect, better information, more or less. Now, somebody else spoke about having more policies in place so that we can be in control of how much data that these companies are collecting from us or that the AI systems are using. How do we f then find the middle ground between improving AI systems without giving them too much data that goes in their data set? All right, so, so the question you're asking is an extremely complex one. Especially as it relates to finding the middle ground between technology, which is clueless about laws and legislation, and people who create those laws and their understanding of how technology works. Um, so, so right now, uh, for the first time in, well, for the first time, uh, Jamaica has implemented a data protection legislation. Um, it goes fully active December 1 of this year. But what that legislation does is it 
gives you, the citizen, total and complete control over your personal data to the point where you can actually tell anybody who has your data how they can use it. Right? This is law. So, so from the standpoint of businesses and how they collect your data and so on, the law prescribes how they must treat with it, um, what you can do, um, you know, as it relates to how you want your data to be managed. Now, here's a challenge with that. What business do you go to when you're talking about an algorithm? Well, what, what business is that? Because you don't talk to an algorithm, right? Um, so the challenge now is how do you create rules in law that govern how intelligent and cognitive systems work, especially when they're constantly learning and changing how they do what they do. So in order to do that, you, you now have to develop a very complex uh, platforms and rule sets that will say, look, in creating the algorithm, so you have to go to the, to the, in my view, to the algorithm level and say, in creating these algorithms, there are some things that you have to build into the algorithm that is in concert with what the law says, right? And it's very difficult to control because if you want to innovate, if you want these systems to learn and become more intelligent, you're constraining it now. So the, the, the thinking is, well, you're constraining innovation if you constrain the algorithms that are learning. So, so it's, it's, it's a huge challenge because it's so complex because we have not yet figured out how to tell systems that they're just functioning on their own based on some algorithms that we create. So it's like, you know, um, when, when Matthew's talking about bias. We have innate biases. So if there are 10 people working on uh, an AI algorithm, the biases of those 10 people will innately find its way into that algorithm. Um, but then what about the billion and a half other people who have varying views? How do you manage that? And we haven't quite found out yet or figured out how to create that balance? It's an excellent question, but it's extremely complex currently because we simply don't understand. And worse, the people who make the laws, uh, they don't really get that either. Um, so, so I think um, it, it could represent an entirely new field of study. It's the how to create that balance between protecting our information, which is borne out in, in laws and rules and regulations, and ensuring that the systems that are playing around with that information all on its own um, are built in such a way that um, it conforms to, to those rules. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, Trevor. You. And in the interest of time, we'll only take that one, one answer. There is a similar question that came from our audience that is focusing again on bias, but asking, what are our recommendations, and perhaps you can answer this one, Godiva, to promote the increased contribution to bridging the data gap we have, especially in developing countries like yourself. You emphasized that in your presentation. Certainly did. Um, so I always like to ground, ground in things. So quite frankly, we have bias in everything that we do, everything. Um, the moment we step outside and we see someone for the first time, we're biased in how we look at them. But what AI is doing is emphasizing bias at scale. So how do you amplify bias when you have millions of data points to work with? Now, the question of access actually tends to feed into bias. Now, Trevor mentioned earlier who it is that we have building these data systems or just these data sets in the first place. Now, addressing bias and bridging that divide, especially for emerging economies, is going to be a question of how much of our information is reflective of our own biases. So how do we use our biases to counterbalance biases that already exist? Um, there have been some very interesting examples coming out 
from Latin America, Brazil, for example, in terms of how they're using tools like PIX. So think about us now using Link to pay for our jelly or pay for um, phone cards or pay, I use it at Pepper Time the other day. Now, what PIX has been able to do in Brazil is that they've been able to use financial data in terms of how persons purchase small things at their corner shop and use that to determine how much can we give this person access to credit. Now, if you were looking at data that was generated in North America, you wouldn't necessarily have that perspective. So our bias in terms of addressing that in emerging markets has to start with, again, how are we collecting data in our local contexts based on our realities? And our realities are often um, formed in terms of the informal economy. How can we capture data that is reflective of people there? How can we capture data in our school system? Yes, there is data that the Ministry of Education has had for years, but how much of that is usable? How much of that is going to reflect um, the dynamic between rural schools, urban schools? How much of it will reflect you know, who has access to good quality teachers um, and good nutrition? So pulling into that, it goes right back to digital literacy and data literacy on top of that. And then from there, as we have a more literate population that understands how their data is being used, we can then start to be the creators of these models that will then be used in our context to solve our economic issues. All right, thank you. Thank you, Godaiva. And I have another question from our audience, and I think, Rachel, this one is up your street. Um, the question is, which comes first, the technology or empowerment? And this person is speaking to the fact that oh our boy. educational systems today are still, shall we say, shackled by some of the the The, the limit. Yes. The and limitations. The question is, given that reality, how do we go forward? Which comes first, the technology or the empowerment? Well, why do we think that one has to come first? Why can't they come together in tandem? You know what I mean? And I think, I think it's important for us to understand that students and learners, I mean, I work with children as young as 18 months right through to 18 years. And when I literally give a three-year-old, they just pick up a phone and they know how to navigate it and they cannot read. On Friday, I was in St. Elizabeth working with a student who is 15 years old and he has no functional literacy skills. He cannot identify letters, he does not know letter sounds, but he can manipulate and go on TikTok and he can show me and find things and go on YouTube, right? So that should speak a little bit about the fact that we may not have to be able to put one ahead of the other, but we may be able to kind of use them together. Now, technology is being used as a form of empowerment, right? <laughs> I just think that um, we really need to examine context when we make um, when, we, when we ask questions like that, I think there is no necessarily, there's not a, a one answer to fit all edu spaces. I think it's something that, you know, we have to look at as we go, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you very much, panelists. We are way over time, so we are told, will you have one, uh, let's accommodate one last from the audience. Can you get the mic to him? So one last question and... If, uh, if I could just say one thing about bias before we get to the question. Um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's, that's why I think it's very important that we as a society um, not just be consumers of AI technology. We're going to have to play a part in the production of the technology. You have to understand that a lot of these AI technologies are coming from first world countries. So they're more concerned about their first world problems. They're using their first world data sets. So going forward, if AI is going to be truly inclusive and equi equitable to us um, human beings, we are going to have to play an active role in, in the production of that technology. I, I'm thinking of a future where each country maybe has its own um, AI that basically it aligns with their culture. Because you'll never create a system that somehow agrees with every human being or every worldview or every cultural um, view on the planet. That's never going to happen. So I think what's going to happen is, or what we're going to have to hap um, do is to create AI systems that align with probably each country's um, worldview uh, going forward. Uh, Thank you, Matthew. We're starting that conversation. I mean, I saw on Friday where 
our local edtech company one on one launch that is going to be releasing una and una is its personalized or ai personalized assistant so i be i believe that we're starting to trend in yeah, that direction i think definitely to the extent that we begin to generate data ourselves we begin to be able to address some of those issues but thank you last question okay good afternoon everyone and thank you for taking my question to the panelists, I realized that there was a common theme between uh, Matthew Godiva and um, Mr. Forrest. So Mr. Forrest spoke about an over-reliance on AI. Uh, Godiva spoke about her favorite teacher and saying that some things that teachers provide are some of the most human things and it's not necessarily about the teaching and learning all the time. And Matthew Stone spoke about being hooked on AI versus human connection. So my question to the panelists is, while it is that AI, uh, with its advent and proliferation, uh, now taking place, how do we preserve uh, humanity, social skills, and critical thinking? Matthew, that sounds like one you can take. Yeah, so there's been a lot of discussion around this, you know, in terms of, because we have these tools that almost, it seems like they're thinking for us, see, they write essays for us, they, um, you know, they can do anything these days. But I think what AI will actually force us as a society, it will actually force us to transcend as a human society in terms of how we think. I think, in fact, AI will free us up to actually think on a much higher level than we're thinking right now. So just imagine a lot of those things that you probably, you know, you kind of had to do day to day. Now AI is doing that. See, you don't have to waste time on the, the things that didn't really require a lot of intelligence. Now it actually frees up your mind to think on a higher level, think more, even increase your intelligence. I think that's actually what will happen. AI will actually force us as a society to actually increase our intelligence. Um, let me, let me, let me, present something to you. I'm going to date myself, right? Okay. Um, there was once a time when, in order for me to communicate with my uncle in Europe, I had to write a letter. A, a letter, as in handwrite a letter. Um, I was fortunate enough to live through a period of time in the 90s, late 80s, 90s, where this thing called email came about. So I didn't write a letter anymore. I wrote an email. What took two weeks to get to him took seconds, right? But an interesting thing happened. I started working and I would send an email to somebody next door. And to me that started to get a little crazy because I could get out of my office, walk next door and talk to the person and tell them the same thing I was telling them in the email. What I'm trying to say here is preservation of the humanity you're talking about depends on you. You need to decide how far you want the technology to govern how you function. You wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? You look at your phone? Or do you look at, for if you are that fortunate, look at the person beside you and say good morning? That's a decision that we make. And what we have to try to instill in, in everybody, and again, education plays a role in that, is do not let technology dictate how you function. You control the technology. Don't let the technology control you. Right? So that's how, you know, if you're talking about preserving the humanity, what AI does, you have to actually play that role. Thank you. Very Thank you. Trevor. Oh, can I just, one last comment, um, and I'll be very brief about him. Okay. No, um, I think one word that has not necessarily been mentioned enough on this stage is um, the arts and, and creativity. Uh, it, it's, it's important to bring that perspective because, again, when you think of what are the things that AI cannot do, it more pertains to like the very human elements of us, or so, us socializing, us caring about people, us having integrity, making decisions that are intuitive. Now, the thing about AI, it cannot make intuitive decisions. It makes decisions based on predictions 
and pattern matching. It basically says, this happened some time ago. If I put all of this together, it's likely that this is going to happen next. And that doesn't allow us to exactly leapfrog. What humans are able to do is to create and reflect art, and we can leapfrog our progress. So whereas AI, to some extent, will allow us to go linearly and a little bit exponentially because there's so much data, I want us to always remember that the part that we play in this is maintaining as much of our humanity as possible, us coming up with big, bold ideas and visions in terms of where we can go next, because AI necessarily will, will not give us that. It will, it will take us through, and it, it will even go ahead and it will generate Da Vinci-like art. So in the pandemic, quite a number of students relied on gamification and virtual reality to actually showcase their feelings and their emotions. So it can do that. And at, the, at that time, that's what children wanted to do. They wanted their feelings acknowledged. And AI facilitated that. And, and platforms like, you know, <laughs> I can't even think of some of them right now. But it, technology allowed for them to tap into their feelings, right? Into the empathy, into, into the social emotional context. Right. God, so I, it I'm, does allow I'm, them I'm, to we, tap. I oh. know that this is a very interesting conversation, <laughs> but we do have to wrap it up. And I, I'm, I'm happy that we're ending on that note because we started off by saying that AI can contribute to building the talent pool that is more creative and more innovative. So yes, it can do a lot even like you speak to, but there are some real limitations. And what we have the opportunity to do is to let it do what it does well and then focus on developing those aspects that it can't do. So I would like to thank the audience for your active participation. I would like to thank every member of our esteemed panel. I think we raised a number of pertinent issues. It is clear that this conversation must continue as we seek to begin the process of employing AI effectively in our education systems. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for our panelists. I don't know about you, but I was thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly educated and informed about the nuances of AI. We heard about the opportunities, we heard about the risks, and we heard that there is more to come and the dis this discussion certainly will continue. So I want to thank all our panelists thank the moderator for that last session for ably you know, leading and guiding the discussion through. And certainly, I know that I was certainly edified. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are approaching this last section of the third annual Rickards Allen Memorial Lecture, we want to focus in this session on the scholarship experience in honor of the life and work of Dr. Rickard Allen, past head of NCB, NCB's groups, um, Human Resource and Procurement Division, an annual scholarship has been earmarked to be awarded to one local student attending the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean pursuant to any one of the um, courses and programs of study, namely the Bachelor of Science in Innovation and Entrepreneurship or the Bachelor of Science in Networking with Cybersecurity. 
over the last few years, we have had two recipients of this scholarship experience, namely Nadian White, and it, last year's recipient was Chanel McPherson. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'll be hearing from Miss Thalia Lynn, NCB Foundation and, records, and the Rickard Allen Scholarship um, Chairperson, who will now bring greetings and remarks from, for this um, scholarship experience. Just a moment while we cue that video. And a little later in the program, we're going to be hearing from last year's recipient um, and about her journey, Ms. Chanel McPherson. She'll join us online and share her experience with us. And then after she's through, we're going to be inviting Ms. Na Mrs. Nad Nadine Matthews Blair as well as our own Professor um, Haldane Davies to come on stage to do this symbolism of the handing over of that scholarship check a little later. At this time, we're going to be hearing from Thalia, no? We're ready? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the video, um, the screen. American, American civil, civil rights, rights and, and children's, children's rights, rights activist Marion Wright Edelman once shared Education is for improving the lives of others and leaving your community and world better than you found it. I believe her words capture perfectly the memory of the life and work of the late Dr. Rickard Allen. For that reason, his utilization of education as a tool for nation building will be kept alive through the Rickard Allen Memorial Lecture and Scholarship. Dr. Rickard Allen, not only encourage our youth and young professionals to adopt an agile philosophy for success, but ensured they were provided with customized digital training through the establishment of the UWI NCB Digital Talent Lab. A passionate advocate for technological development, digitization and data application were central to his approach to organizational change. Joining NCB in 2002, the late Dr. Allen made stellar contributions throughout his 18-year tenure, which galvanized his rise to the role of a senior general manager of the Group Human Resources and Facilities Division. He exemplified a pioneering approach to the re-imaging and restructuring of his division while successfully fostering team cohesion and commitment. Dr. Allen's passion building youth and communities through education and digital innovation has also influenced the focus of the NCB Foundation, which I chair. Consequently, we want to ensure his memory lives on in the hearts and minds of the people he treasured the most, the youth of our nation. That's why we're here today. The NCB Foundation supports digital transformation through digital media education, coding, robotics, animation, gaming boot camps, among other projects. Our digital focus is complemented by our life skills agenda, which offers training in financial literacy, communication, problem solving, and conflict resolution. Developing the communities that we serve is at the heart of what we do at NCB Foundation. The Rickard Allen Scholarship signals a shared philosophy between a beloved departed colleague and a company on which he has left an indelible mark. In addition to honoring our late colleague, this scholarship helps us to continue delivering on our promise to empower people, build communities, and unlock dreams everywhere we operate. We are therefore delighted to be presenting this check in support of the Dr. Rickard Allen Scholarship today. Thank you so much for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Ms. Thalia Lynn, Chairman of the NCB Foundation and the Rickard Schol Allen Scholarship. So a beneficiary of that scholarship last year will join us right now to share her own experience and to, I guess, share her gratitude for this scholarship experience. Ms. Chanel McPherson, 
who is now joining us online, will make her presentation at this time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so elated to be here. Can everyone hear me? I would assume. Yes, we're hearing you. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So I was asked to do a presentation today regarding my scholarship. And I was saying that what better way to go about ex telling you guys my experience from receiving the scholarship from that time until now, without giving you all a reflection of what happened throughout my journey and becoming a part of the UCC family. Once again, I want to thank uh, NCB Foundation for giving me this opportunity to be on this platform and on UCC as well for having me enroll in, into the program. Now, this scholarship was awarded, was awarded in 2022. I'm currently a first year student. I'm doing a BSc, a Bachelor of Science in Networking with Cybersecurity. And I wanna reflect on my first, second, and third semester, and also to provide you all with a conclusion of my reflection throughout my journey. I wanna start with what, what inspired me to even apply for the NCB Dr. Rickert Allen Scholarship. First of all, my family is one of my biggest motivational factor, all right? Um, they have inspired me throughout my lifetime to, to, to be different and to make a change within my family as well as the community that I'm from. Also, my curiosity about um, technology and the way it impacts us on our daily lives and how networks and security protocols keep our online privacy safe has also allowed me to start my studies in cybersecurity and networking and networking. I'm sorry about that, guys. Now, in my first semester, you know, the first semester is that time of the year where we have to be prepared. This is my first time in college. Uh, NCB gave me the opportunity. I applied. I won the scholarship, and I would say, "Hey, how do I prepare?" So I was about. <laughs> it was about the registration phase. Um, getting in contact with UCC, ensure that everything is going good, um, keeping abreast with uh, NCB as well to ensure that, you know, everything is aligned for the ready of start of this first semester. Um, throughout that time as well, my, 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 my project by the name of CODED actually started. And CODED is a project that helps inner city youths in teaching them how to code in my first semester. So while school was happening, this was also something that I was volunteering my time to do um, in different inner city communities. Uh, in the first semester as well, I had applied for ICON, which is the Internet Corporation for assigned name and numbers. I remember Ms. Natalie Rose sending that email to us and saying, guys, you know, apply. It's a wonderful opportunity. Now, ICON is responsible for our, our domain name system which is uh, responsible for ensuring that the IP address that we normally see on our different system, whether it be our laptops or our phone, that's the 199, perhaps five number, that uh, internet protocol address. They're responsible for taking that address and transforming that address into a readable domain name, such as, um, let's say, ncb.com. Um, so that the devices, they can communicate online. So I was selected, I was one of the persons, um, well, I was the person that was selected from Jamaica to represent UCC and the country online. And that experience was so good in Mexico. So that was uh, ICON 76 Forum. That's also something I accomplished uh, through the scholarship. Um, in my first semester, semester, I also thought about getting some mentorship because, you know, um, this is my first time navigating the college world. And I also want to thank Ms. Natalie Rose. She's also been a great mentor throughout my, my journey. So thank you, Ms. Natalie Rose, um, if you're here online listening to this audio. And in that semester, as well, in the same breath, I also joined the IT club at UCC. Yes, in my second semester, <laughs> I 
I can actually accept in my next gen applications, you know, that I'm ready and I'm pumped. Um, I went on CVM at Sunrise with Sir um, Daniel from ICON, who is actually the Caribbean representative there. And uh, we also spoke about what ICON is and, uh, and the journey there to ICON. Um, <clears throat> in the second semester, I joined uh, Internet Society uh, chapter, Jamaica chapter, in which in ISA community, uh, Ms. Rose who is also the president of ISA. She had um, informed me as well that I'll be responsible for teaching some children how to be safe online. So I also joined that club as well with Ms. Rose. They are guiding me along the process, who also gave me my endorsement letter. Uh, I was invited in my second semester to two, not one, but two um, uh, UCC webinars in which I spoke on, I spoke on um, ICON on my journey. I did my presentation, which my ICON presentation, which spoke on um, DNS abuse in Jamaica's uh, through, well, Jamaica's banking system through DNS abuse, right? Cyber attacks on Jamaica's banking system through DNS abuse. And that's a presentation that I did there at one of the webinars. Uh, the other webinars focused on um, what can we do with an IT degree. Those are also two of the events that I was invited to by UCC. And overall, my because of this scholarship, my, my network grew and also, uh, sure, did I, so did I. So it was, it has been a fabulous, fabulous time um, throughout my UCC journey so far. Now going into my third semester, um, that's summer coming. Um, what can we expect? No, I'm currently in a collaboration with ICON to deploy DNSSEC in Jamaica. Now, while I'm here, I would like to take the opportunity just to speak a little bit on 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 DNS sec. This is a this is actually an icon, an icon project in which I believe that it could help us a lot in regards to Jamaica cybersecurity um, system. Now, DNS sec is uh, domain names, system security extensions, and what DNS sec does it ensure that it gives authentication to ensure that whatever websites that we're going on going on is actually the origin website and this is done through public key cryptography and digital signatures in which i had the opportunity to learn more about in my last semester with professor um solomon ogara in that cryptography class so everything has been aligned since I've started UCC and, and, and going through my, my, my degree in cybersecurity. Um, apart from that, I'll be, I'll be raising awareness with ICON, just ICON awareness, ensuring that other students are aware of what ICON does and the possibilities of being involved in their network and also doing a lot of DNS. Um, DNSSEC workshops, I'm making DNSSEC being aware as well. I'm hoping that uh, Ms. Natalie Rose and I, we have already been speaking in regards to um, having different webinars surrounding ICON and DNSSEC and having some of these persons from ICON coming to speak to us about it as well. Uh, I'll be also entering a essay, an international essay writing competition um, coming in summer. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the competition that I'm going to be entering as well. So the international, so the, the, the SR writing competition is, is brought through by the International Institute of Communication. And what it does, it focuses on cybersecurity and privacy in this rapid um, transforming technological landscape. So in my essay, I will explore the mitigation of cybersecurity breaches while emphasizing the importance of privacy in this dynamic field. So I'm looking forward to entering that competition and see where that opportunity takes me as well. And all that, of course, I, I, I have been required to maintain my GPA 
and to ensure that I'm always, I'm always, even before my scholarship, I've been volunteering and to ensure that I keep that same energy um, that I had before even applying to the scholarship. Now, I could simply say that, um, I can simply say that my experience has been highly satisfying and rewarding. And I would implore students all across Jamaica to to go on the NCB platforms and apply for scholarships because they are there and even UCC, they have so many scholarships on their platform as well. So I'm just gonna take the time out again to thank everybody for listening to my presentation and giving me the opportunity to showcase what it is that I've been through throughout my, 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 my first year thus far at UCC. Thank you everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Chanel McPherson. A testimony of the impact of the Dr. Rickard Allen scholarship. And we see, we clearly see that she has been remarkably blessed by this scholarship and is making her impact on the world. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, we're going to be inviting Mrs. Matthews Blair, VP of Group Marketing Analytics and Digital for NCB, and Professor Haldane Davies to the stage as we will now do the symbolic handover of the check for the next recipient of the Dr. Rickard Allen Scholarship um, Award. So ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for the two heads, two representatives from these institutions. And we know that the next recipient of this award, the 2023 recipient of this award, will certainly leave his or her mark on the landscape of technology and innovation as we honor the legacy of Dr. Rickard Allen. All right, so photo ops as we do the symbolic handing over of this scholarship award. Where are the paparazzi? I'm not seeing the paparazzi. I'm seeing a few, I'm seeing a few, they're coming down. Well, paparazzi number two. <laughs> A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. All right, and we'll see these photos on social media. And the algorithm will do what it has to do with it, right? <laughs> All right, thank you so very much. Thank you so very much to both of you. You may return to your seats. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of today's lecture and we've been fed lots of information about AI and its impact on the educational space. And so we're gonna be inviting at this time, Mr. Trevor Chung to come and bring closing remarks as we wrap up this session. Mr. Chung, Mr. Trevor Chung is the AVP at NCB head of digital and design, and he brings tremendous experience from previous roles at GoDaddy, Facebook, Goldman Sachs, and a number of other startups in the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, offering closing remarks to this very wonderful session today is Mr. Trevor Chung. A round of applause for him, please. I do realize that I am what's standing in between being fed actual food versus information. And I have the unenviable privilege to give closing remarks following our speakers, um, Nadine and Nicole, whom I have the pleasure of working with on a daily basis, as well as that panel, um, really engaging panel, uh, including you know Trevor Godiva, Rachel, Matthew. Um, and then even following the accomplishments of Chanel from her first, I, I was not doing that in my first year of university. I know that. And maybe that's why I was not a recipient of <laughs> such scholarship. Um, that is very productive. And I'm now looking at what I accomplished for the rest of the year because I, using ChatGPT, um, I think that's the real question. 
So I'm going to do three things in this segment, you know, to close out. I am going to urge you to act. And I'm going to share a bit about how NCB has already acted. And I'm going to make the case uh, to be an optimist, to focus on the upside. I know that we've explored, you know, like, w what's the topic here? Impact, ethics, access, society, lots of risks, lots, but lots of upside. And so I wanted to close on that note. Act. So I hope you found today's panel informative and enlightening, but more than that, I hope that it has encouraged some biased action. Um, I hope that it encourages you to act, and if you are already acting, to act with increased urgency. The future's already here. We heard Rachel talking about how countless tools are already being used in our prep schools, in our high schools, whether it's Grammarly, Quillbot, and there are about five others that were brought up. And this is the next generation, and their impact on the world is coming. Um, you know, AI is now empowered at the masses level. Pandora's out the box. But it's also just started. And we're having the right conversations, conversations like we're having in this room right now. And to be honest, if you're a university student, which means that you're within the audience, you are already using AI. Um, the chances are very high that you are already using it. And I hope that you continue to use it and carry it forward and bring it with you into the workplace because you are actually AI natives. Um, I'm having to adopt something that has come sort of like after my time. I have done the majority of my learning or at least my formal learning. Um, so I want students who are listening in to be encouraged to make use of those tools because organizations are hungry for that talent, that unlocking talent. The second piece I want to talk about is what NCB has done. Um, as we move forward into this broader age of digital transformation, we have, we at NCB, have long understood the importance of embracing new technology to better serve our customers, to stay ahead of the competition. Um, we make significant investments in our digital infrastructure. We try and launch new products and services all the time that revolutionize the way our customers bank. Uh, I won't go into all of the details around many of the um, products that you know Nicole Brown's team you know you've heard that she leads EIM and she has certainly led the charge there but the success to this point of our digital transformation is testament to the power of innovation and the benefits that it brings for the customer and for the business and I think by embracing new technologies like NCB are currently doing with AI it's only going to increase um, hopefully increase that edge and hopefully allow us to better serve the customer. And then the future, the case to be optimistic. Um, I think we've heard about the risks and they are very real risks. We've heard about the risks of bias in the model. We've heard about the risks of it potentially dulling our creative thinking. And I think that we also have to recognize that this is the new frontier and that the technology itself has not had time to mature for public usage just yet. And so I want to draw an analogy to a technology that we all use in our daily lives. And that whilst we certainly understand there are risks, it doesn't stop us from using it and, and, and we continue to drive that in, um, usage up. Um, and that's cars. I think it's recent enough where it doesn't feel like a technological innovation. But in 1913, 34 people died for every 10,000 vehicles on the road. In 2021, the death rate per 10,000 vehicles is one and a half. There has been time within the market for this new technology to mature. People understand how to drive cars better. Cars themselves are inbuilt and inherently more safe. The infrastructure, the roads, the signage, everything about this technology innovation has had time to mature and made it safe for large scale public usage. And that is going to happen with AI. So for now, I'd urge you all to focus on the upside, to focus on the power that it possesses, and have broad faith that the technology community, um, the, the broader public, and our governments, and our legislation will ensure that it matures for large public adoption. Um, and that is why I'm personally optimistic. So for myself, my colleagues at NCB, and our panelists, I'd like you to thank you all for attending. And, um, and please have a bias for action.
At this time, I'm going to invite um, our moderators and our panelists to this stage. We have a special token of our appreciation for the amazing conversation that we had here today. We to show our gratitude, and so we're inviting them on the stage for another photo op. Miss Golding, Miss Brown, Miss McDonald, Mr. Forrest, <laughs> and Mr. Stone, and um, handing over the tokens will be our very own Dr. Dawkins. <laughs> 